very pleased to host Bharat Arihan from Computer Science, uh, one of my colleagues here and one of the newest CAM field members. He is one of the world's leading experts in computer vision, which is probably one of the most important fields in artificial intelligence right now. Uh, he did his PhD in 2015 from UC Berkeley and then spent a couple of years at Facebook AI research uh, before joining us at Cornell. So, take it away. Thanks, Austin, for the actually very generous introduction. So, as a disclaimer before I start, um, there's actually going to be precious little math in the, in the talk. Um, my goal here is actually not so much to present to you uh, clever mathematical solutions as to pose to you a problem that's been keeping me awake as a computer vision uh, researcher. So just to give you a background on what I uh, work on, um, so the problem I work on is recognition. So we want uh, nowadays to build self-driving cars for whatever reason. Um, when the self-driving car sees a view like this, we want the self-driving car to say, okay, you know, this is there is uh, some novel object that is a deer here, and because there's a deer here, I want to avoid the deer, but also there's a car on the oncoming in the on the, uh, this ongoing traffic, there's a car there, so I actually want to uh, figure out how to do, um, how to best navigate the situation. So the core component here is that, given a scene that looks like this, I want to be able to say, this is a deer, this is a car, that's some other car, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, going further, also reason about what's going on, such as the fact that the deer is crossing the road, the oncoming the car is coming towards me, there is the possibility of an accident, and so on and so forth. Now, we've been working on versions of this problem as computer vision, the computer vision community has been working on versions of this problem for quite a while. So, um, in the 90s, we were doing, uh, we, we focused on digit recognition, and there was uh, quite a bit of uh, success in uh, OCR or optical character recognition, but you know, digits are much simpler. Only recently, it's been uh, only the 2010s, did we find ourselves confident enough to do sort of general recognition. So, given an image, being able to recognize just any kind of camera, any kind of object in the image. Um, so this is the ImageNet data set, which was for the ImageNet benchmark, which is one of the most, uh, which was um, at the time considered one of the most challenging benchmarks for recognition. The machine had to, uh, given an image, recognize it as belonging to any one of a thousand classes. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, even though this was considered challenging, it's actually uh, much simpler than the kind of uh, recognition that we humans do on a day-to-day -day basis. So by some estimates, for example, uh, by some conservative estimates, humans recognize something like 30,000 uh, classes uh, as a matter of day-to-day. -day. So when the ImageNet challenge came out, uh, we had, so this is the error rate by the ImageNet standards. Um, the, a lot of the classes in this ImageNet data set are not classes that we might encounter day to day, but even humans with very limited uh, exposure to these classes can get error rates of 5%. Okay? So um, that's to give you a scale of what, this, um, what these parts show. So these are uh, two challenge, um, these are the challenge winners in 2010 and 2011. And as you can see, we were making fairly slow progress. So we had about two points of improvement uh, in one year. Um, in, around this time, if you got a one-point improvement on a benchmark like this, you had a PhD. Um, then in 2012, something changed, um, which was that we got rediscovered uh, convolutional networks. And very rapidly, we were able to get uh, error rates that were similar to that of untrained humans. Right? So, um, convolutional networks really uh, bet these uh, prior techniques by a very significant margin, and that has led to a lot of questions about uh, research about this. So, right? so for example, um, one question people uh, as well people started asking was why do convolutional networks work so well given the fact that they are so high capacity? 
Um, why don't they overfit? How is optimization working when the loss, uh, when the objective is so non-convex, and so on. But today, what I want to posit to you is that this is, this was actually not the only surprising result, and in my view, it was not even the most, the most surprising result. Um, so, following uh, this initial result that you know convolutional networks can be trained to do this thousand class categorization very well. Um, we, uh, or as in we, as in the community, uh, started figuring out that we, these networks actually seem to have gained some sort of uh, general understanding of images. So let me be clear what I mean. So just to be uh, uh, clear what we mean by convolutional networks, for the purposes of this talk, all that matters is that a convolutional network is a composition of functions, each of which has some set of parameters. These functions are basic, uh, are fairly uh, basic building blocks, things like convolution with some filters, uh, maybe an affine function, and so on. And uh, the network is, uh, the convolutional network basically takes an image as input, and as output, it produces a distribution over the different class labels. So in ImageNet, it produces a distribution over the thousand classes. Um, and over training, basically, the uh, parameters of each of these functions, so the filters and the convolution, the weights of the affine functions, those are tuned so that this class distribution matches what a uh, human labeler um, annotated on some training images. Now, given this composition of functions, uh, several people realized that you could think of this uh, once you've trained your uh, convolutional network, you could think of this as being, this entire network as being the composition of two different functions. One, which can, well, the first uh, function is this uh, first n minus one layers, which we call, uh, which we can think of as a feature extractor. It takes an image as input, and it produces some intermediate representation, some tensor as output. And the last layer, the single last function, is a very simple linear classifier. So it takes this tensor as input, runs an affine function on it, passes it through some uh, normalization to produce a probability number. So, so you can think of the convolutional network as being a big, massive feature extractor and a tiny, very simple classifier. Now, what that allows, what this uh, way of thinking allows you to do is once you get a new image classification problem, you can say, okay, you know, I'm going to freeze these parameters, freeze the first n minus one layers, and only replace this last linear classifier with a new function. So, um, the so I'm going to once I've trained my convolutional network on this image classification task, I'm going to freeze the first part of my network, use that as sort of a fixed function and just search for the best affine function for any new task. So, more precisely, so let's say a task, and let's use the word task to define a, a tuple of a data set and a loss function. Let's, I'm just going to think of a convolutional network as being some classifier H composed with some feature extractor P. Um, the classifier is basically a very simple function, typically an affine function. Uh, the convolutional network is basically is a big function composed of a bunch of building blocks. So I'll first train this entire convolutional network on one task D. So I'll basically search for both the feature extractor and the classifier to minimize the loss on the training set. And then when I get a new task, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the feature extractor the same, I'm going to keep V the same, and only train uh, H. Sorry, if I, I'm not sure why this is a mistake. This is H. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep the features the same, just retrain the classifier. Now, a priori, um, this, uh, I hope you realize that a priori, this is a somewhat strange thing to do. Right? So, we used, you know, we've learned this model. There's no reason to suppose that this model, this first n minus one layers, are doing anything reasonable for this other task. Right? So you've trained it on this thousand class problem. Any, if all our intuition suggests that it has learned whatever it needs to do to solve that thousand class problem. 
there is no reason to suppose that it's going to be able to learn features, learn features that are useful for any other classification problem. And yet, that's what we found. So this is a subset of results from three papers that came out on this, um, where basically what people found was that you could take the previous state of the art on any task, simply replace that with this you know, ImageNet features plus linear, linear classifier, and get better results. So this column is the previous state of the art. So each entry here was the subject of several PhD theses. And then what we did, what they did was let's replace this with just ImageNet features plus a classifier. And we the um, what ended up was we get you get pretty big improvements on a lot of these tasks. Now there is a a bit of a gradation among these tasks. So for example, the first three tasks here are in some sense similar to the ImageNet classification task. So for example, um, the bird species classification has 200 bird species. A subset of those species are actually in ImageNet. Right? So this is not maybe a uh, very fair, um, it's not fair to call this a different task. But these tasks were completely different. So for example, in human attribute classification, this is where the network or the model has to classify whether the person is uh, tall or short, whether it's a, um, it's a child or an adult, whether it's and, and so on and so forth, right? Or whether they're wearing a sweater or a, a t-shirt and so on. So on ImageNet, there are none, none of these attribute labels. And in fact, ImageNet does not even have a person class. So the, the images may have had people, but the network was trained, um, the labels that the network was trained on, none of them had person. So it is strange then that it was able to, the features that we get, capture enough of the person to actually uh, improve on this, right? uh, improve on the state of the art. The last two tasks, we didn't get that, we didn't see that much improvement, but still uh, we get non-zero performance. So um, this is just classification. The funny thing is this does not just um, work well for classification. Um, so, in my where in the group I was in uh, in grad school, we found that you could do the same thing for other tasks. So for other you know classes of tasks, other families of tasks. So object detection, for example, is the problem where you can't just you don't just uh, produce a label for an image. You're also supposed to produce a bounding box. So you're supposed to produce a box saying this is where the bird is. And one of the most uh, uh, highly cited papers from uh, one of my colleagues basically showed that this, uh, they, they could replace, so this colleague was an object detection expert, he'd spent his entire uh, PhD and uh, half of his postdoc trying to get this number up from 32 to 34, and then over the course of two months he basically just replaced the whatever system he was using with a simple classifier on uh, these image net features and got a 12 point improvement. So this was a uh, um, an interesting period of time period to be uh, in the lab. Um, we found that I could, we could do even more. So with a bit of, um, if, if you were clever about pulling features from this train network, so instead of the simple strategy that I described, if you combine features from a couple of different layers, you could actually do tasks or problems that um, had pe that people had not even uh, considered doing before. So um, we considered this task where you don't eat, don't just draw a bounding box, but also try to segment the object. And the very first um, instance we did um, basically doubled the performance of the previous state of the art. Um, and similarly, you can also go further and try to label uh, individual joint locations of people. And again, this is something that the network never saw before because it was never asked to label pose or uh, identify anatomical joints, but the features somehow are sufficient for doing this. So um, the basic way the computer vision, the, you know, how did the computer vision community react? Well, you know, we, did, uh, we had a couple of years where there was a very uh, simple template for getting a computer vision paper, which was you pick your favorite unsolved recognition problem, you use your image net features, and then you break past it. And you profit in this, um, in, sometimes in very literal sense. Um, 
So this is a key result that training a convolutional network on one task seems to produce features that are useful for task B. And this is the result that I find fairly mysterious. I'm not entirely sure why this happens. It turns out to be true for a wide variety of target tasks. So uh, lots of tasks that we had seen um, that, we, that we want to solve seem to be amenable to this approach. It only seems to be true for a few source tasks. So in particular, it seems that so ImageNet, training a network on ImageNet seems to be uh, the only uh, way of getting a network to do this or getting some features to do this. But even so, it seemed to depend on how big the data set was, right? how big ImageNet was. But it also depended on the number of classes. So if, you, if I reduce the number of classes from 1,000 to 100 by keeping the same images, the same data set, so by just using coarser labels, for example, it actually hurt this transfer. So the features were not transferable if the number of classes were smaller. Um, another uh, result that I personally found counterintuitive was that um, so if you you can make convolutional networks deeper by just composing more and more functions and larger functions now machine learning would tell us that you know if you have a high capacity model that's more likely to overfit um, finally deeper networks seem to transfer better so the features learned by deeper convolutional networks were actually better at the uh, target task and I want to posit that this kind of goes, this whole thing goes beyond what we typically consider generalization in machine learning. So in generalization in machine learning, you have a given task, you have seen data and unseen data, you train a model on the seen data, and you have bounds that show that it works on unseen data. Now for neural for networks, even these questions are uh, as it an answer, but here we are not even talking about the same task. We're talking about the model learning something that's useful for some completely different task. Um, now, so th this whole thing I find mysterious. Um, that said, there is actually, uh, like as humans, you know, as in computer vision our model is humans, and as humans we do generalize much. Uh, but we do generalize in a similar manner. So. Um, the, the tasks that we do day to day are uh, not don't necessarily prepare us for what we'll see the next day. So, as an example, um, this animal is a Philippine tarsier. Some of you have been to my job club, so you probably have seen this image before. But um, how many of you have seen this before? Animal before? Okay, maybe a couple. Um, so, for those of you who have not seen this before, here are three animals. Which of them is a Philippine Tarsier? Okay. So all of us are, I mean, we, I'm not going to take a poll because it's always you know, very easy to, for us to say that the top one is the Philippine Tarsier. These two are not Philippine Tarsiers. But it um, gets even better, which is that not only are we able to identify this as a Philippine Tarsier, having never seen a Philippine Tarsier before. So for us, you know, this is a different novel task. This is a novel pl class of uh, animals that we are recognizing. So in all, in all senses, it's a novel task. But we are also able to say a lot more. So for example, if we look at the other two options, we are able to say that this animal is actually closer to this one than to the toad. Right? That is something we are able to say. We are able to also do things like um, go beyond classification to uh, understanding anatomy across two very different classes. So given a point here on this animal, I can ask, well, where does this point appear on this image or on this other image? And I might say, well, this kind of uh, uh, anatomical structure seems fairly similar, more to a left-right uh, flip. So clearly, our feature representation also has this property that it's generalizing to things that we've not seen before. But um, we have we don't have a very good model for why such generalization should work. Um, what you know, what tasks transfer in this way? So are there other tasks that you can train on so that it actually transfers well? And then how can we improve this transfer? So con I've shown you that convolutional networks transfer well in a particular way, but as humans, we do a lot more, as I showed you. We can recognize new classes with just one training example. So how can we actually improve that? So that's sort of the um, 
key questions that I'm interested in. And the first one, so why such transfer should work, um, is one that I'm very curious about, and there's very little work on this. So there's very little work on understanding why in sort of something like training on ImageNet leads to a feature representation transfer as well. Um, there's a few intuitions that people have. Right? So people, so one claim that a lot of people make is that all these tasks have similar invariances in the sense that there are certain transformations that you can do to the image that will not change the label. And those transformations are shared across these tasks. So you, know, you can rotate the object and that will not change the class label. And that's true whether it's a cat or whether it's a human. Um, a similar uh, or, a, or a related notion is this idea that the things that are important are uh, the same. So for example, you know, edges or boundaries tend to be important for recognition. So they are the same no matter what the task. But the reason, all of this reasoning is fairly post hoc. So given this feature representation, we've tried to fit what is going, what, what is really going on. What we don't have is a computational predictive understanding. So given a new task, I can't tell you whether you know, training on ImageNet will transfer well to this or not, or vice versa. And I can't um, give you a way to testing this. There is some initial work on this, which is, um, so for example, this for these set of authors very recently um, tried to use the visual information matrix to characterize tasks. Um, but they require a probe network. And uh, the probe network was also a network trained on ImageNet. So the problem was this again, why is ImageNet? Then we found that this choice is important. So um, it turns out that, so this is some initial steps, but still the question of why um, particular task transfer, why this particular task transfers so well is still completely unclear. Okay. So what are these? Oh, sorry, I should explain this one. <laughs> um, so these are a bunch of tasks. So they basically took existing data sets and constructed sub tasks out of this by sampling classes. Um, each dot, although the projector doesn't have enough resolution to draw the dots, each dot represents a particular um, task that the, the features were trained on. So for example, uh, one of these, the blue triangle, corresponds to a uh, convolutional network trained on ImageNet. And so what e for each task, what they've shown is they've shown um, the performance of a uh, linear classifier trained on that particular features. So basically... Um, so that one is recognizing butterflies. Yes. And but the others I don't recommend. I actually don't know enough about species to tell you what they are. But um, the ones that are CUB are the Caltech UCSD first data set, which was collected in collaboration with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, third is the iNaturalist data set, which was also um, something that uh, colleagues in uh, Cornell Tech search a lot. One called Corvidy is recognized in different species of crows. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> the others? So what is it you're deducing from this? So what this shows, so what this plot tell, it says is that for each task, there's a range of accuracy you can get depending on where you pre-trained the feature extractor. The blue dot indicates the image net feature extractor, which generally tends to get fairly low error. The red cross is what they recommend, which I'm not actually going into. But uh, this basically suggests that for different tasks, there is actually a range of accuracy you can get depending on what you pre-train your feature extractor on, what you train the initial network. Um, that's a good question. I don't actually know if anyone has done that particular experiment. Um, there is some amount of engineering issues involved in the fact that the birds data set is much smaller, so you know you want a comparably large data set to make the apples to apples comparison. But I don't know if people have done that. That's a good question. Um, okay, so that was the mystery I wanted to pose to you. So you know, if you have thoughts on this mystery and how to resolve it, please. Talk to 
Um, the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about what um, I've been thinking about, what I've been doing, which corresponds to you know, um, uh, two other questions. So the first question is, well, I've shown you one particular task where if you train this convolutional network, this model, it learns useful features. Are there other tasks that have this property? And then the second question is whether we can improve this kind of transfer, whether we can improve how well the um, um, this feature representation will be done. So, are there other tasks that transfer well? So one of the reasons why um, this is an important question to ask is because ImageNet is kind of special. It's a large data set with lots of classes. Um, it took several years and several million dollars to actually collect. So it's actually not a scalable approach if you want to go beyond internet images. So if you want to recognize something, uh, like if you want a similar kind of strategy for, um, let's say, satellite imagery, or if you want a similar strategy for recognizing radiology images, um, this is not the right, we can't replicate this. Um, so the, one of the questions is, can we actually get similar transfer without labels? So can we produce, can we learn a feature representation that's useful for multiple tasks, but without using ImageNet labels? Um, so this corresponds to uh, the whole question, the, there's a class of techniques that people have proposed, um, which is often called self-supervision, where the idea is that you kind of create labels out of the data using uh, some heuristic procedure. So for example, one approach is that you take a data set of images and then you construct rotated copies of those images. And the network or the model has to predict whether the image is rotated or not. Um, another is you convert all your images to grayscale and you, uh, the network's job, the model's job is to produce the total back the color. Um, a third is to predict patch position. So you are given cropped patches from an image and you have to put them in the right order. And finally, you, there's also this uh, task that seems to be really effective nowadays, which is um, this idea that you want to recognize individual instances in the data set. So you want to know, you basically want to remember each image. You want to say that, okay, from this image, um, this particular version is exactly the same as this image, but it's not this image even though they might be very similar objects. Um, so we also did this, um, caught on this uh, whole bandwagon a while back. So I'll talk a little bit about what we thought. Um, so uh, what we thought a uh, while back was that the only other successful mode of such, successful form of such transfer that we knew of is the human perception. And clearly, the human perceptual system is not using a million label, so what is it using? Um, so, our idea was that this is because humans see videos, they don't see images. And in videos, well, things move, so they kind of pop out from the background. So in this image, you know, the cat uh, appears as a distinct object because it is moving. So, we had this very simple idea that we would use simple motion segmentation. So you know, just identify pixels that are moving distinctly from the background. This is fairly uh, a fairly heuristic procedure. It's fairly, in fact, produces fairly bad results. It's a bit hard to see in this uh, projector. For some reason, the color is too dark. But basically, you get a video. You um, figure out where the pixels are moving. You estimate the uh, what's called the optical flow. And you segment uh, the object. Uh, using motion, so you identify the pixels that move differently from the background, and then you train a network to predict these moving pixels from a single frame. So the network just gets to see a single frame, and it has to predict what's going to move. Okay. Um, the intuition for this uh, came from two things. One is that in humans, it is known that um, this kind of motion-based segmentation appears developmentally earlier than other forms of segmentation. So infants can actually um, group <coughs> objects based on motion a lot earlier than uh, other forms of uh, segmentation. Um, the other idea was this notion that, well, to do this task, 
correctly, the network probably needs to recognize the object to figure out, okay, you know, this, what will move here? Well, what will move? I know person, people move, so maybe I should recognize people. So in the um, route of producing this, we maybe will recognize, uh, learn to recognize people. So we compared this uh, thing and we compared to a bunch of these prior work and we found that, okay, you know, our approach works a little bit better. Um, but when we compared it to ImageNet transfer, so this is ours, this is ImageNet, there is still a big jump. So even, in, you know, there's a big jump compared to all this other work that does this kind of self supervised And this graph has stayed true even to this day. In spite of a lot of work on this kind of self supervised learning, there's no task that people have come up with that's as good as supervised classification, and that's as good as ImageNet classification. So the mystery still remains. We don't know exactly what ImageNet is doing. Why is it producing such good features for recognition? Um, okay, so delving deeper into this, um, one thing we realized recently is that maybe all of this is a function of internet images. Right? So all of these images are collected from the internet. Maybe it is because there's something going on in internet images, photographers biased, you know, the kinds of things people take photographs about. Maybe uh, also, you know, invariants, for example, right? if everyone takes photographs like this, and so on. So uh, maybe the key common factor here is internet images. Right? So um, what we are doing now is asking, well, can we get similar transfer on non-internet imagery, right? So if we are not doing ImageNet, can we uh, get similar transfer? So uh, we're looking at, so this is what the Bram who's sitting there, where we're trying to look at medical images, satellite imagery, a uh, lot of different data sets from ranging across a different range of uh, difficulty and the range of domains. And even here we are getting surprising conclusions. So for example, one of the conclusions, um, one of the things that Ram found was that uh, one of the tasks he's considering is satellite image classification. So given a satellite image, you want to um, classify land cover usage, so how, whether it's farmland or um, urban or things like that. And weirdly, the ImageNet features still work well for performing this classification, uh, which, which we thought was, was strange because, you know, I mean, this now is a completely different domain. It's not internet images. Um, also, this task that we that I proposed, which was uh, you know figuring out whether an image is rotated or not. This uh, even though satellite images are rotationally invariant, because there's no canonical up direction when you're looking up, uh, at a satellite photograph. Even so, using this kind of a rotation does seem to learn some useful features. So. It's still unclear, even based on our experiments, it's still unclear when self-supervised tasks work and when they don't. So or when, when these kinds of transfer work and when they don't. What does predicting rotation mean? What, what, would, what would predicting the rotation of that picture mean? So the input to the network is a picture like, like this. And it's supposed to say whether it's rotated or not. I don't know what that means. Exactly, right? So <laughs> what, that's the issue. So it's easy when the image is a cat, right? So when you, if I give an image that looks like this, you might say, is, it, is this a rotated copy of an actual image or not? And the answer is, well, probably yes, because usually, you know, cats appear upright, maybe, right? Um, in the satellite image context, basically the only way the network can solve this task is if it memorized all the images in the data set. Right? If it knew every single image in the data set and said, oh, you know, I've seen this image before and I know that particular image is, you know, I know it appears in this orientation, not in that orientation. Only then it can do this. Otherwise, you know, physically this is impossible. There wouldn't be cues from sunlight and shadows and things that could be learned? Yes. Like that? Yes. So there might be other channels. There might be image artifacts. Um, the rotation task, because for the way it's structured, they do uh, it does tend to redu remove artifacts because of rotation. So that is taken care of. But there might be statistical properties in these images that uh, the network is, is using. Um, 
But the key thing is, even so, it's learning something that's useful for classification. That's sort of the funny part. Yeah. Did you try having the number just predict like a random trick associated with each image? I think that's one of uh, Bram's experiments, like trying to predict a random, uh, not well. I think one of the experiments we did discuss was, you know, trying to predict a random class, class label, like randomly you label each image with a random number and, you know, just ask it to predict it. That is a uh, sanity experiment that we are running, yes. Okay. But you don't know whether it works or not. Not yet, yeah. This is all in progress right now. Okay. Um, okay, so this is all still mysterious. Um, let me shift gears a bit and ask whether we can make this transfer better. So, you know, we've shown that this uh, this kind of uh, features seem generalized, but can we actually make this better? Um, so, I showed you earlier that um, as humans we can do this, given a single image of a Philippine Garcia, we can actually uh, identify which of these other three are Philippine Garcias. Um, but even with this uh, with these ImageNet features that I just described, these the best features, computer vision features we have, um, current models have a really big problem with this. So when you reduce the number of um, uh, training examples from 1,000 to 100 to 1, the accuracy basically falls off a cliff. Um, and this is, in general, a big problem because uh, rare classes are really common. So data sets have uh, all organically collected data sets have a very heavy date. There are some classes that are just really, really rare. So we want to be able to do uh, well on rare classes, and that is something that uh, humans can do. So the idea is, can we build a feature representation that actually works better when, it come, when we can on, on these rare classes? Um, and just to make sure that we understand what the challenge is, the issue is that uh, there is a lot of intra-class variation. Right? So if I consider the leopard class, there's just way too many images of the leopard. And from a single image of this leopard to understand what a leopard is, that requires some uh, pretty sophisticated features that can put all of these things together. Um, so, uh, what we uh, have been looking at, so this is uh, work that's happening in my group, but also in other groups, is that can we actually, instead of training a representation simply to classify images and image net, can we actually reframe the problem? Can we actually learn how to learn? So this, this phrase I'm taking from a uh, paper by Sebastian uh, thrown in the early 90s. Um, the idea is that by taking classes for which I have lots of data, can I sort of simulate many different tasks on this and learn from that? And what do I want to learn? What I want to learn is that um, basically this intuitive notion that I talked about, that there are shared invariances, um, certain, like all classes of objects rotate, there are shared features of importance, um, so figuring out what those features of importance are. So for example, I might learn that you know, if I'm trying to do, uh, if, if the new classes that I'm going to encounter are animals, then I should probably focus on the animal in the image and not on the vegetation, and so on. Um, the, sorry, how much time do we have? Okay. So, there is, um, the way we and others have formalized this is through what I call meta learning. Meta learning technically refers to one of these uh, approaches, but um, I, I find the term useful in general. So, the idea is as follows. So any, the task that we are going to solve at the end is going to be you take a training set with labels and a test set, and then some magic happens, and then you produce predictions on the test set. And in this magic, basically what's going to happen is you're going to use your features feature representation to train a classifier on this training set, and then you're going to use that classifier to make a prediction on the test set. What meta learning does is to say that we're going to abstract this entire thingy into a learnable function. So it's going to be a black box with some parameters W, and we are going to just learn those parameters. 
So basically what we are going to do is we are going to design a class of functions parameterized by some page w. And this function now actually takes two inputs, a test example x and a training set, um, which we call uh, of the so denoted here as test string. And it outputs a probability distribution over labels. So the function takes as input a training set and a test a labeled training set and a test example and produces a probability distribution over labels. So one example of this, the simplest example of this, um, is this thing called prototypical networks, which is actually a fancy name for a very simple idea, which is that you know we will take our training set, use a feature extractor to produce uh, feature representations. And then we'll compute a class prototype for each class by simply averaging the feature features for that class. And then any test example will just be assigned to the nearest class. So it's basically nearest neighbors in a learned feature space. Um, there's some math that describes what this is, but you know it's irrelevant. The main thing is this is just a fairly uh, simple. Uh, approach to do this but to take this backwards. Then what we'll do is we'll use a large set of subclasses that we have, like I mentioned. And on this, we're going to simulate tasks. So we're going to subsample the classes, subsample the images, and sample tiny training sets and test sets and feed it to the black box, and then make sure that the black box is able to produce good labels. So we're going to run these simulated experiments. So instead of saying, okay, you know, here's a task, solve it, you're going to say, in every iteration, I'll give you a task. You have to learn on the task and test immediately. Right? And I'll evaluate you on how well you do, and then we'll optimize. Um, so you have a metadata set of tasks. In every training iteration, you sample a training set and a test set. You feed it to the black box and then any loss on the, uh, on, the, on the output predictions, you back propagate through to update the parameters. So this is a fairly general class of techniques, and the different techniques just differ on the architecture of this function engine. Um, the prototypical network I just described is maybe it's the simplest version, but there's um, an army here that we can have This isn't based on the dimension at all. So the data set that often is often used is something like an H. Okay. Right. But, so but you're not like pre-training on ImageNet. The H isn't somehow related. Yeah, so I'm replacing the pre-training on ImageNet. I'm replacing ImageNet classification with this training procedure. Okay. So I'm instead of training on one task, I'm trying to train on a la large environment of simulated tasks. Um so for example, and you know the the whole Game in this in this class of techniques is to figure out the right uh, edge, like what this is, what this black box is. Um, so, as an example, one thing I'll talk just uh, quickly about one thing we did, which was that um, we included in a localization module. So, for example, you know you can say, oh, you know, instead of just producing a feature representation, let's first localize the object and then uh, compute features, and um, so you first compute, localize the object in your training set and test set, and then compute features. And this you can do sort of in a fairly straightforward manner, and you get sort of a pretty big improvement over state of the art. Um, so what does this suggest for this broader question of transfer. So what this suggests now is that we don't understand how this transfer works. We don't understand which task transfer well, but we can improve it. <laughs> sort of uh, computer vision in one sentence. <laughs> so um, and we, we have uh, subsequent work which shows that you can actually improve it even further by piecing out object parts and so on. But anyway, so, um, going back to where we were, so basically the key uh, question that we, have, uh, that we had was, 
um, why should this transfer work? So that question is still unanswered. Un and I think uh, there is very little work going on, and I'd love to know if there are actually um, thing, um, ideas that you have on understanding why this transfer works. Um, there's a lot more work going on on trying to figure out other tasks that transfer well. Um, but right now, for some reason, ImageNet classification is still the best. And you know, unless Brand comes with something in the course of the next year or so, um, we, th 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 this, is, this is the best we have. Um, we can improve transfer. And surprisingly, the way uh, to do that is actually by going away from the black box model. So instead of using a black box convolutional network, the main um, game that we uh, found the best results from was that if we explicitly localize object parts, that actually helps with transfer. So in this case, we were looking specifically at a bird classification problem. But um, in general, going away from this whole black box neural network architectures actually does improve transfer. So it's not as if this is a property of black box neural networks. Um, so I'm actually going to end here and leave you um, with the questions and Yeah, so that, that's basically the challenge, but yeah, someone also asked this. So there, there's the engineering challenge, which is that, you know, there isn't a data set that's large enough. There's actually, actually, I should mention that there are a couple of um, data points there. So there is another data set which is considered roughly the same scale for scene classification, image net is object classification, um, and they have shown transfer, like both ways. So um, it, it does seem as if it's not specifically image net, but any data set would that many images and that many classes can actually. Yeah. Earlier you said that the image map you have uh, like a few layers to, you know, hundreds I mean, something more, more layers. So in your experiment transfer, which one? I mean, which one? You do you use, use the largest? Uh, do the people use the largest number of layers to do the experiment, or just any? It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's robust. Any kind of net, number of layers. It's a so generalized. It's it's robust in the sense that um, any number of layers will transfer, but the one that transfers best is the deepest. Deepest so, with a lot of data. Come again? Deepest with a lot of data, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's trained with a lot of data, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the lot of data you can't remove. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's fundamental. Yeah. yeah. So, did I understand you to say that if you have some big neural network that has already been trained and recognized? something, almost anything, that its previous training makes the training of it to do, a, to recognize something else, a, a shorter process than, it, than if, it, the, if it has not been trained at all. And the more you've trained it, the better it becomes at recognizing other new things. Yes, that's sort of the effect, that, that's the effect that we are observing, yes. Um, now subject to, you know, the experiments that we've done, yes. And I noticed that you, you, you gave an example of recognizing similar features of uh, vertebrates. Right. And I can imagine that we understand why vertebrates have similar structures. But I, I'd like, I wonder how they do on insects. And yes. more particularly, recognizing an orthopter from a coil. Is something which there are people they just do it automatically. They know these things. But me, I look at these and, and I yeah, I've tried. It's hard. I also recognizing mushrooms. There's something <laughs> that I'm pretty good at, but uh, trying to tell other people why mushrooms are different is not as easy as you might think. 
I agree with that completely. So, the, yes, so the example I showed you was a bit cherry-picked in that sense, right? Because it, it corresponds to the class of things in the world that we interact with so much that we have very good models of. Um, so there is a different, separately, I'm also, I've also been working on this, these whole fine-grained challenges in these novel domains. And there, this notion of transfer is a bit less clear. So in particular, this um, one of the things that we're exploring is this notion of if you, two things we're exploring. One is, you know, if you have an expert who can actually explain these different distinctions, does that actually, is that useful? Is that important? And it seems that that is. Um, and whether having domain specific sort of understanding of the object when you're recognizing uh, object parts specific to that class of objects, is that useful? And th those things are, I think, useful. That said, it's still early days because the, the main challenge is that there aren't enough data sets for this, right? Because um, we had an initial, at one of the workshops I was in, there was a talk by um, uh, an endomologist who was, uh, who was bemoaning the fact that there aren't enough curators in the world now who know all the beetles, all the different kinds of beetles. And so they simply cannot create a large data set of beetles because there aren't enough people to allocate all the samples. Like all the people, people who have that knowledge are getting old and retiring and all the new people, there aren't enough new people doing this. So the collecting a data set that can allow us to do this experiment is also um, a bit of a challenge. But this is fascinating, yes. I, I definitely agree with, it, with the entire point of the fine-grained expert domains. Yeah. So in your first slide, I think you mentioned self-driving cars. So are those systems using transfer learning and self-supervision in effective ways? Um, they're using, I'm not actually sure what they're using. So depending on what Kind of the models that are in play right now are often sort of pre-trained on ImageNet and then trained on some other task and then trained on next and trained on right? My understanding is that the main data that's used to train for self-driving cars is they've got human drivers driving cars and so they know like here are all the what, what all the sensors say, right? And here's the move that the human driver made. So it's actually lots of supervised data. So that so so yes, but that's also the the. Well, that's on the vision path. That's yeah, the that's the control task, yeah, exactly, right? Exactly. So there's the the perception part, which may have some image features. It's really hard to say because you know no one really knows what people are actually putting under the hood. Um, but yeah. I remember somebody said, I don't know if they used it for using cars or anything, but I remember somebody um, trained the vision data um, like in a self-supervised way by saying that like. The stuff that was near the car was probably safe because the human driver probably would not be driving into something that was dangerous. Oh, that's interesting. That it's is. kind of the stuff on the bottom of the screen. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting. Yeah, do they actually do something? Yeah. Uh, how correlated is the improvement that you get between using you know previous method and ImageNet training? and the difference in the size of your training sets between ImageNet, because I, I think this is following up on that sort of reverse engineering question where basically Image, ImageNet has this huge advantage, which is that you have a bunch of images, right, that you, that you pre-train on. Um, it wouldn't be surprising to me that the main advantage comes from that, right? And so if the idea is that you, you have this massive scale separation on the size of things that you're training on, then it would show up as a positive correlation between like the improvement that you get and the difference in the, the size of the world. Right, so there's a right. few things I should say to that. Okay, so um, first, yes. Right, so uh, the, well, yes and no. Okay. So this, I, I would like to draw comparisons to three different models, right? So model A, let's say, is a kernel method on some um, hand design features. Model B is a neural network or convolutional network trained from scratch on the target task. Model C is the ImageNet features. So the comparison between model B and model C, yes, that's correlated with the uh, data set size. Right? So once the data set size becomes sort of large enough, like hundreds of thousands of images, then training a network just on this target task works well. Um, but this comparison between this model C and model A is 
not so much correlated with the data set size per se because um, handcrafted features with kernel methods seem to not be, uh, or at least the features that we have, um, were not able to take advantage of large data set sizes. So there's a separate line of work which showed that the performance of these approaches um, tapered off with uh, black or black or with. No, with uh, um, the other thing I wanted to also say is that um, the scale issue at which we talk, the scale that we are talking about of like hundreds of thousands of images, that's actually really large to the point that it's meaningful to study the small data set case because of the fact that, uh, but yeah. All right, let's thank Brock for more time.